will talk about uh, waterfront uh, development revisited uh, with observations from Abidjan. And uh, Abidjan is a coastal metropolis, so it has a coastal line, and then it has also a big lagoon within the city. So it has many, many waterfronts. And as many other cities in the global, uh, yeah, in the normal, normal global north as well, but in the global south, it's more extreme, it has different fragments. Yeah, you have an area that looks like more like Manhattan, which is considered to be the real Abidjan, the Abidjan. Then you have some areas that look like villas, there are social housing, there are apartment blocks, and you have uh, a large part of the city that looks, okay, let me see. How do I get this? That looks uh, like informal settlements, yeah, as you see on the upper right. And then you know, there's always a division between Abidjan and the other Abidjan. Yeah? I'm doing research on the other Abidjan. So, so uh, I prepared this paper actually for a conference. So, um, where I discuss differences of waterfront development in the global north and global south. And uh, waterfront development is not an urban theory as such, but it's rather a kind of conceptual body of uh, literature uh, based on case studies for mainly the global north. And uh, what is important to know when you see urban studies in general, then African studies are of, often just neglected. So there are not many case studies on African cities. They are not as huge data sets. They are not really fed into the debate. Yeah, if it's a French-speaking African city, it never really shows up in a debate, except maybe Dakar or Kinshasa. But when you see how many cities we have in Africa, they are super underrepresented. So um, what is important to know is that waterfronts are really ambiguous uh, spaces which contain and symbolize a number of dualities, as you can see here. And uh, from a global north perspective, waterfront development constitutes investment for the conversion of underused land into better used land in order to revaluate them. Yeah? So this implies land use changes, uh, changes in infrastructure, and uh, mainly it's done to boost the city image as well as the global competitiveness of the city. And uh, for this presentation, I formulated four postulates that I will go through, uh, which I will contrast with empirical data. First, I want to show that uh, waterfronts were important elements for social town planning. Then the trajectory is leading to waterfronts as problem spaces differ in the global north, global south. The vulnerabilities also differ that we find there. And waterfronts are, in Africa, are contested public land and legal gray zones. So. So waterfront development is a special form of urban development. Central locations, excellent visibility result in higher return rates for real estate so investments. So we talk about 40 to 60% more um, returns. And uh, waterfronts are more prone to processes of gentrification in other urban spaces. And due to the high visibility, yeah, or what some people would call Instagrammability today, <laughs> buildings at waterfront locations may be an asset for city marketing. Yeah? And I quote here, cities must actively pursue, construct positive, imaginative geographers to endure that they become and remain hotspots. The redevelopment of highly visible urban water site sites has become a key mechanism by which positive images are constructed. So, so African investments were encouraged during the early 2000s when waterfront development was rolled out globally. But the spill out uh, to Africa should be interpreted by considering Africa as the last global real estate frontier. So at the moment, global finance and loans for large urban projects can be attained at very low interest rates, you know that. And um, city reconstruction is going on in many African cities in the form of large urban projects. So there are big master plans that are laid over the existing city. If it's a coastal city, then the coast and the harbor are usually part of this, these master plans. So often transnational companies from the Gulf states, uh, the Maghreb, uh, Southeast Asia carry models of urban development from their regions to Africa, but this is problematic because by the time these cities were built, there was less awareness for environmental things, for climate change adaptation and other things. So um, uh, the large scale projects in Africa stand for an escalating speculative urbanism and gentrification. And um, there are many projects for new, expensive, futuristic looking city districts in African coastal cities, but they are overlooked in the waterfront debate. I don't know why. Maybe because they don't wear the waterfront label. But there are many examples. Um, for example, um, there are master plans for Kigamboni Nuda city center, for Gate City in Mombasa, Island of Conakry, River City in Kinshasa, Eco Atlantic in Nigeria, um, and the Bay of Luanda. Yeah. And the Bay of Luanda illustrates how a new waterfront may strengthen uh, city branding and state power. So the Angolan government first attracted intense national investors, 
but after it was built, they just withdraw the contract and build it, uh, bought it back at construction cost. Yeah, and I think this is something that can happen in the global south, but not in the global north, because any investor would have shoot the government there, it would have had a fair chance to be successful. Uh, another uh, project is really large project in West Africa is Eco Atlantic uh, in Lagos. So this is reclaimed land. Um, and the whole narrative is very much about sustainability and everything, but maybe ecological sustainability, surely not social sustainability. So visions of well-ordered functioning and virtual city dominated real estate discourses in the global south, but they do not take the real African city, the informally evolved city into account, yeah, with all the slums and informal areas. And um, while master plans are produced by foreign real estate developers, the African authorities usually take a supporter's role. So they make sure the land is, uh, uh, they, they do the land acquisition and also like make sure there's no disturbing population on these lands. And what I want to, what I argued in the paper, and I will just do that really briefly, is that the narrative about uh, waterfront development in the global north and global south very differ. And to be really, really brief, what you had in uh, the global north were like um, cities, uh, ports in the city with some uh, residential areas that were uh, close by, the docklands, that were owned by the port authorities. And when um, the containerization started, the municipalities moved the ports out of the city, so there was a divide between the city and the port, and these areas became abandoned because the workers had no work anymore, they moved somewhere else, and these lands became underused lands, and often also contaminated lands because the factories were there, and so there were brown land areas. And urban planners and municipalities in Global North initiated the return to the waterfronts in the 1970s, and this redevelopment brought underused land into use again, with a higher economic value, so water sites became public again, accessible again, but part of the private real estate market. So in colonial port cities, it was different. The port was very close to the city. Actually, the cities developed because there was a port when the colonial system uh, collapsed, and there was often a neglect of the port. You got the city divide also, the city on one hand side, the port on the other hand side, but people didn't like the port. They were not, area, not interested in that. So these sites became backyards of the city. And that's what you see in the global south very often, that the beaches, the public areas, are marginalized, dirty places. Yeah, you have the dumping grounds there, you have the big roads there, you have um, industries there, you have pollution there, it's downstream, all the kind of sewage that is usually untreated or not treated enough ends up there. So they are actually dirty and marginalized places. And they are places where uh, urban poor usually settle. Yeah? And there are many examples. West Point Monrovia is uh, one example. There are number some examples from Lagos, uh, from Abidjan as well, uh, from Accra. Many examples like this. Yeah. So these really poor areas by the water. So now let's come to Abidjan. Um, the French succeeded in expanding their political influence in the area in the second half of the 19th century. And uh, Abidjan became the third uh, capital, uh, colonial capital. And uh, in 1933, and it remained the capital of the Cote d'Ivoire after independence until 83. Um, and then what is also important that the city was an economic and financial hub of West Africa before the Ivorian Civil War and the post-electoral crisis. So we have a post uh, period full of conflict with very little governments from 2002 until 2011. So, the original layout of Abidjan follows principle of planning culture of the AOF, which is the um, Federation of French Colonies. So all the French colonies were summarized under this federation, and they all had the same planning principles. And um, the lagoon served as an intra-urban social and sanitary segregation of various populations, which were the Europeans, the Syrian Lebanese, the African elite, and the local workers. And uh, there was a port established first by the Atlantic, then there was, uh, in the 1951, they built a canal, uh, a canal uh, Vridi Canal, and then they shifted the port to this area. But there was always this big segregation and distances, long distance between the colonial city, that is sitting here, the residential quarters of the workers, and the workplaces. And uh, in the planning, usually the waterfronts were not considered because they were swampy, they were dirty, and far away and uh, actually not habitable. 
but they became really popular for these uh, workers because they wanted to be closer to their workplaces, so they established informal settlements, and later more and more poor people moved into these settlements. So this is um, a little bit about climate change. So there was a study from 2013, which I found quite striking, and uh, there assessed future, future flood, loss, flood, flood, flood losses in major coastal cities, and uh, Abidjan features as only African city among the first 20. Yeah? And this is very interesting, and my, one could ask why, yeah, because there is some logic, there will be more infrastructure built by the water. And you can see that in Abidjan very clearly, the city moves closer and closer to the waterfronts that are vulnerable. So. But we also need to consider housing policy, it's very important. So, um, in the 1960s, it was after independence, the policy of young independent Cote d'Ivoire was guided by modernism, supplemented with social equality and developmentalism, in which slum eradication seemed necessary. That's also the time when the skyline of Abidjan was built. The skyline you saw, that's from the 60s, 70s. So a new urban plan uh, was established, breaking in some regards with the colonial planning tradition, but the planners were still French. Abidjan was subjected to major reconstruction of innovation. Economic and social housing was constructed by the state on land that was formerly occupied by slums. So they eradicated the slums to build uh, social and economic housing. The modern urban project had its downside. Of course, the people who lived in these slums had to move somewhere else. There were more unplanned, illegal, and precarious housing, which the government actually wanted to curb. So the urbanism of the bulldozer has destroyed about 20% of the total housing stock in Abidjan by forced evictions with only five years. And I'm talking about a period from 69 to 73. Yeah, 20% of the total housing stock of our city was destroyed. Um, so much of the exposed population moved to the waterfronts and beaches of Port Bouy municipal district that we see here. And during these conflict years that I talked about, more and more of these uh, war refugees also moved into these areas. So typical densities in these areas today are about 26,800 people per square meters. And we don't talk about elevated housing, it's mean single story buildings. So waterfronts have become problem spaces because they're intensively used, densely populated and under-provisioned. Plus they are located on vulnerable land. So very different scenario than in the global north that I have uh, mentioned. Um, and um, uh, the global risk of flooding yeah, increases as a result of sea level rise, as we know, and so, uh, storm surges. And um, large parts of Abidjan are situated less than a meter above sea level, especially in Port Bouy, between the lagoon and the Atlantic. So climate change projections suggest that especially the international airport, the airport, the international road to Accra could be affected by sea level rise. And also that southern parts of the city will be uninhabitable. And... Um, most of these areas are populated by very poor people. So all these areas that you see here, yeah? starting from, even from here, here, over here, over here. I mean, there are many, many areas here in these areas are really just kind of slum areas, as you would call them. Um, so over the years, spontaneous settlements were either politically tolerated or forcefully exposed, but both dominant urban policies prevented infrastructure upgrading. Yeah, um, But again, there's a legacy because the first expulsions and forced evictions were introduced by the French when they started to build a colonial city. So again, there's this kind of historical trajectory. So since 2011, the Abidjan city government implemented evictions of spontaneous settlements, arguing that these were quarters under risk. So spaces where waterfront communities settled were turned into landscapes of rubble. The city administration of Abidjan pursued strategies of short-term crisis management, and in 2014, as you can see by the beach, yeah, they evicted uh, settlements by the beach and 10,000 people lost their home. So and now I just show you some of the picture. So this is settlement evicted in 2017. This is one in 2018. All this has been settlement, which is now uh, empty. And then within the city, you also see many, many destructive, uh, destructive places. That has to do with flooding as well, because People during the conflict years started building, the city became denser and denser, and all the sewage system also broke. So now they start destroying city to re-establish the sewage system. Yeah. We have open sewage everywhere. People are still using it, taking water from the sewage system to do their businesses. It's, yeah. 
So another environmental issue is massive sand uh, extraction from the lagoon for construction purposes. So sand is also used for land reclamation by real estate companies where plastic wage and rubble is used in the informal construction sectors. Many quarters of Abidjan literally are built on water and currently largest land plots are reclaimed um, uh, for the international, po international port and uh, Zoo Bruno, which is like um, an area that has been a dumping ground, then there was an informal settlement, then there was a slum area, and now it's a regular settlement. Yeah. And you see people reclaimed with waste, with rubble, with tires, with everything. And that blocks the drainage system, of course, and has really an influence on the whole, influence on the whole um, system. So inundations are a big problem, Abidjan, but the question is, is it climate change or are these things also behind this? Uh, another issue that I wanted to talk about is um, um, uh, the, the question of law and land tenure. So waterfronts in Abidjan are public by law, and according to a maritime law, 25 meters from the natural waterline are public land. But over the years, land was reclaimed from the lagoon in many places, while cartography was completely neglected. Does, nobody knows where is actually natural water line. Yeah, it's a matter of interpretation, and it cannot really be controlled. And uh, plus, there is the question also like, it's a public uh, land, but who has a say on this? Yeah, and this is the place where I'm working. So this is a peninsula from far. This is how it looks now. It's a settlement that has been urbanized to, since 2012. We have 60,000 people living there, and. Um, so it's public land, it belongs to the state, it has been given as a concession to the airport, so it's strictly public, it shouldn't be inhabited. The municipality, uh, the city of uh, Abidjan wants to, uh, has, has integrated it into the master plan for the eco airport city, so the idea would be to evict all the people. The municipality wants the people to stay because they don't know where else they can host them. Yeah. And on a very local level, there's also something, especially in Abidjan, you have rural enclaves within the city. So you had some old fishermen villages, and uh, they are somehow autonomous. So they're associated with municipal districts, but the say has a chieftaincy council. So this has also, is actually under the chieftaincy council. But the, munis the municipal borders and the customary borders don't match, so they overlap. So there's really a question, who can do what, who can decide what, the municipality cannot do anything because the land is for the chieftaincy, so they would actually need to buy it from the chieftaincy. The chieftaincy doesn't want to sell it. How can you develop an area like this? Very difficult. Huh? So this is just some idea, also how it looks. Some houses look better, some right? This is uh, how people really start building into the lagoon, yeah, with uh, reclamation of waste, a wobble. And some people live very close by the lagoon. So if the lagoon just raises a little bit, the water table is really, really high, everything will be flooded. Yeah? And they don't have any escape opportunity. They're not on, they don't have houses like you just mentioned. So when we, when we look at uh, the two debates, yeah, when you just look at debate mainly based on Global North cases, and you look at the debate or the, the narrative from Global South cases, there are some common variables. But if you look in detail, it looks very different. Mm -hmm. So. And um, maybe as an input for our debate, I would uh, I thought about what is interesting. What can you draw from this um, from this uh, presentation? Uh, so first of all, there are, people need to be aware when they do some transform uh, transformative adaptation planning or anything that there are many many uh, divisions that are there. Language division in debate, disciplinary uh, divisions, many many things. So you have to bring people together first. I think that's very important then planners always have the idea that data information cartography is like here. It's not, absolutely not, very different. Yeah, trajectories I mentioned, land tenure governance I mentioned. There's an interest, of course, always, but in Global Soft, they also have a lot of dependencies on foreign investors, on foreign donors, and so on. And then there's, of course, this vision of planning sustainably, yeah, be doing like this, which is absolutely contra the logics of real estate market. And this has not been uh, considered enough, I believe. Yeah, because the people who have money are not the public authorities, but the real estate uh, companies. In general, what we see is rapid, unplanned, irreversible urbanization, and this is just a challenge that we are facing. Thank you very much.